Good everyone and welcome to a talk about zircon chronochemistry which is a word I think we're going to hear a bit more about in, in coming years. I use the word to mean ultimately using the combining chemistry and chronology to look at the temporal evolution of, of chemical characteristics. In this instance, we're going to look at the temporal evolution of the chemical characteristics of zircon in detrital sediments with a view to understanding something or predicting something about gold and copper porphyry fertility. Um, right, uh, I'm Tim Island, some of you may know. Um, this work is would have not been possible without the support of Santiago Gigola and Colin Burge in the field for First Quantum, um, and Alyssa Stefanova at the Geological Institute of the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, who have been our um, very diligent supporter and executor of a lot of laser ablation ICPMS work um, over the last five, six years. Right, so a very quick outline. We're going to talk about exploration tools and why they matter. Um, ultimately, as I said, this is a talk about detrital zircon chronology and chemistry. Um, oh, I jumped into that. So the setup here is, as I'm imagining it, um, and I'm use this um, classic section of the um, Peruvian, I guess, uh, shallow to mid crust within the magmatic arc, and the nature of the relationship between arc volcanic rocks um, in the and related plutons that sit underneath and intrude into the arc volcanic material. We might imagine that the kinds of stocks or at, at, at largest batholiths that are parental to porphyry copper systems reside in this, in this architecture. And if we erode off part of that material, then some of the then zircons from all of those rocks accumulate in, in sediments downstream from the district and by analyzing that kind of sedimentary material, we hope to be able to say something intelligent about the, the likelihood that the upstream materials include a good quality porphyry system and whether that is a gold bearing porphyry or a copper bearing porphyry. I'm gonna show examples from Panama and Argentina and I'm not gonna have a, a separate discussion section, but we'll get to that when we're talking about Argentina. So, I'm an, I'm an explorer, um, and so it's important to me that we can take research and research capacity, such as laser ablation ICPMS kit, which has been installed in, in unis around the world in the last 10 or 20 years, and turn it to some practical um, utilization. So we need a collection technology, you know, what material we're we gonna work on and how do we get it? Well, there's not nothing much easier than collecting heavy minerals in a gold pan, what kind of data are we going to use? In this instance, we're using, as I said, laser ablation chronology and chemistry supported by CL images of the zircon grains. And we need a body of work that permits the interpretation of this data. And so this, this talk, I hope, serves as a small contribution to that body of data. Um, what we really want to know from, from an exploration standpoint is can we use the trial zircons to infer anything sensible? about prospectivity um, of porphyry AOIs. I'm not going to dwell on this slide at all. It's only there to highlight that I'm not the guy doing the heavy lifting uh, in terms of what we understand about zircon chemistry. I'm leaning very heavily on uh, a whole bunch of esteemed authors who have recognized um, characteristics of, of zircon chemistry associated with porphyries. Um, but specifically, I'm indebted for, to, for at least for the inspiration of this piece of work to uh, Bruce Rawlick and co-workers um, in the Tampakan district. And this particular application of plotting the chemistry of zircons against their age struck me as, as a really neat way of getting at how, how porphyry camps evolve. So we're going to try to do that in the Petakia district of central Panama. Um, this is where we run our Cobra Panama mine at the moment. We're exploiting the Botija ore body. Um, and we ran around, this is going back a couple of years now, we ran around the district and collected a bunch of sediments. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, it's worth pointing out, we know quite a bit about the, um, about the Pedicchia batholith and related porphyries. Uh, the oldest age known from the batholith itself is about 32 million years old and it gets progressively younger toward the north and culminates with the emplacement of the porphyries at 
around about 28 MA. Um, that's what it looks like. Um, it's not the funnest place to go sampling necessarily, um, but this is why we do it, because if we were out here doing a conventional geochemical survey um, and we ended up with 10 pretty strong copper gold anomalies, I'd really like to know which one is of those 10 is most likely to be associated with a great porphyry. And so that's why we want to investigate the zircons to prioritize among, um, among a larger number of targets. So this is what we see um, in terms of the age distribution. We see that there's a broad spread from about 25 MA going back into the, the middle Eocene. And that spreads too broad to be a single event. Um, that there's, there's been protracted crystallization of zircon from at least 35 MA to about 25. And especially we see this little um, subsidiary peak here at, um, at about the time that the porphyries were in place. In terms of chemistry, I've put a series of proxies here on these charts and I've drawn some very loose lines on top of them um, at, to indicate the, the kind of trend that I think I see in this data. Um, I haven't applied any robust statistics to it yet. It's, this is all relatively new to us, um, but I'm willing for the moment to suggest that, that these trends are, are real, albeit that they're fuzzy. Um, if I put the, the one sigma errors on the same charts, you'll see quite how fuzzy they are. Um, nonetheless, and if you know, it might be the case that statistically we can blow this out of the water and show it all to, all to be garbage. Um, that's a conversation I'm, I'm very open to having uh, with anyone who has the skills. But for the moment, we look at, I look at these things and I think there's a trend going on. And I think in this case, what, what I see is an evolution lasting 10 or 15 million years um, leading up to some change in the chemistry of the system around about when the mineralization happens and then a fairly rapid decline in magmatic productivity. Here's another some rocks from another prospect just up the road in which we have porphyries with veins, multiple phases of porphyritic rocks um, and some polylithic tuffs that you would hope represent a grab bag of things associated with the overall volcanic environment. No batholith in this particular instance. Um, and what we see here in the yellow is a much narrower distribution of, um, of zircon ages um, and no real trends to speak of. Um, you could try to force, maybe try to force some lines through these, but even I'm not very comfortable with that. Um, this looks like a bit of a flash in the pan event to me. Um, and what we later learn is that this system is, um, is primarily gold rich, um, gets to ore grade in places, um, but the copper, it's, it's very much a copper pour, porphyry. Um, and so that got me thinking as to whether there was a relationship between the, the duration of like the gestation period, if you like, of a porphyry system um, and its copper or gold uh, metal budget. So let's go to a place where we know we have both. Um, I'm going to jump into Western Argentina and a place in, in this neck of the woods around Tacatarabajo where we have, we know we have Eocene mineralization and, and Miocene mineralization. Uh, the Miocene stuff is classic Maracunga belt material with lots of banded quartz magnetite veins. Um, relatively shallowly in place, high up in the volcanic pile, no batholithic rocks there either. Um, and of course, there's some younger volcanics um, overlying that that might get in the way. Let's see what happens. Here we go. Um, this is a collection of um, three or four sediments and a few rocks all bundled in together. Um, we see both the peaks of magmatic productivity and mineralization that are expected for the Maracunga belt environment. And we see this long tail of Eocene and Oligocene grains. Um, so the Miocene things, yep, okay. And there's some good numbers in there in terms of Europium anomalies and, and oxidation. Temperatures go down to fairly low values. I see what I think are trends in there. And sure enough, that culminates or coincides with the, the known age of mineralization um, of porphyry, of gold rich porphyries in placed into the Miocene volcanic pile. The bigger question is what to make of this long tail. What I see is a very loose, poorly, like low data density, 
but poorly developed, nonetheless trend toward improving fertility over 10 or 15 million years that culminates in some change in zircon chemistry, um, especially a, 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 an increase in the range of, of chemical response of the zircons within that time period. Um, and sure enough, there is an Eocene aged porphyry, latest Eocene aged porphyry in this neck of the woods um, that coincides roughly with that, with that time interval. So what I would propose to you here is that what we're seeing in this sample is, a, is the cryptic record of, um, of a fertile Eocene Oligocene uh, magmatic evolution. And interestingly, that long protracted history corresponds to a mineralization event that is copper moly in flavor rather than copper gold, whereas the Miocene event, um, which has a shorter ramp up um, toward um, zircon fertility proxies, um, is dominated by its gold um, metal budget. And so that's my pitch that I'm, I suspect we can infer something about gold or copper uh, metal budget from the, the length of the gestation period of, of the magmas associated with the porphyry. So that's my pitch. Um, thank you for listening. An invitation that if you'd like to discuss the subject further, or if you have a porphyry project and you'd like us to do this kind of work for you, then please get in touch. My name's Tim and there's my email address. Thanks.